Welcome to Face to Facts. I am Nick Face. We welcome you to 2018. This is our second show, actually, of the year. Uh, sitting to my left today, we have a returning guest, Joe Papalardo. Welcome Good to be back. back. And we have a new kid on the block. Not from the band, just new kid on the block. That's Tom Smith. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, thank you. What we're trying to do this year here on Face to Facts, we're trying to revamp our format here a little bit. So you're going to be seeing some different changes that we'll be adding in to help our audience be able to interact with us a little bit more so you can share some opinions about all things sports. So we hope you get a chance to voice your opinion so we can share our opinion as well each week when we're with you on Face the Facts. Um, we'll be doing a special poll for our audience a little bit later here in the show. Uh, right now, I would like to start off the show with actually the Boston Bruins. That really hasn't happened that much here on Face the Facts for starting a show out with the Bruins. They deserve it. They are playing outstanding hockey right now, and it's a chance for the three of us to really talk about how this team is doing, why they're doing so well, and what our expectations are as they continue to uh, hit, hit the grind as the season goes on. So, Tom, we kind of look at as our, as our hockey guy to start first. Tom, I just want to have your opinion here about what you think of the Bruins right now. Uh, well, other than, you know, the Vegas Golden Knights, the Bruins are probably the best hockey team in the league right now. They have a 15-game point streak. Mm -hmm. Their top line of Bergeron, Marshawn, and Pasternak have a combined 76 points in 22 games. Um, I mean, they're just playing fantastic right now. The, all the young guys are playing great. They're mm -hmm. all doing well. Um, it's just a team of well-prospected young guys that are playing right now. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I agree okay. with that statement. I also think that, you know, huge veteran play from Marshawn and Bergeron and yep. surprisingly who I don't usually like a lot is Char hasn't played too <laughs> awful this year, which kind of helps us a lot. Is that surprising? It yeah. is. I, I mean, it started I, last year. I though. said it last, last time on the show that we did. Is he going to be Yager? Is he the Yager of defense? It's possible. I mean, it, I, it, it's, it started last year where he was playing with Brandon Carlo the yep. entire season. And now he's with the stud Charlie McAvoy, and that's just helping him even further his play. Um, I've never been a fan of Chara up until great. last year. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he's playing great right now. Um, Why haven't you been a fan of Chara from everything that he's done as a Bruin? Let's just let's, um, let's pretend I don't know. I just feel like for, you know, Part of it's probably expectations for what he should have been doing for a long time, and it took him, you know, this long to get going. And I think for a guy that's, you know, considered a top defenseman in the league, he kind of makes a lot of mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that veterans don't make. And it's, you know, until, like he said last year, you know, he started to really progress. And I think him playing with McAvoy this year, too, with that youth and that speed and defense, you know, it helps him. Makes up for some of the things he probably can't do as well. Okay, that's a good well, point. Well, I, th I think what helps with playing with the young guy is, too, he can play deeper in the offensive zone because he has all the young guys that can go back and defend against him. But I, I mean, after the 2013 season, I, that's when I started losing faith in Char, and that's when okay. I started saying, Let's, we need to trade him while we still can get something for him. So, do you think the young guys have kind of rejuvenated his career? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's been a whole different person out there on the ice. I agree. You know, all three of us are in agreement here. I think he's been an X factor with continuing his career and progressing at a level where I don't think a 40-year-old really could do. I mean, here we go again with 40 years old is the new, what, 25? Huh. You got Brady still throwing touchdowns and playoff games and everything. You got yeah. Chara going out there doing his thing. 40 isn't so old anymore, I yeah. guess. I, 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 with the Bruins playing so well, I just want to say that they're, I just looked at the standings a few minutes ago. They're in second place right now. They got two games at hand against Washington, who have the same amount of points as them, and they're only five points behind the best team in the Eastern Conference. Do you think they can rumble with the big boys? Absolutely. Meaning, yeah. meaning can they rumble Absolute, with yes. the Lightning? Can they rumble with Washington? All, all, all that. Absolutely. Yep. How about Why? the Western Conference side? Oh, totally. Yeah. Okay. Totally. They, I, the, the Capitals don't look good at all this year. Holtby is probably having the worst season of his career. Yeah. Um, Crawford's hurt right now. He, no one knows when he's coming back mm -hmm. for Chicago. Um, 
I mean, the only competition really is Vegas. And I think it's, I mean, it's January. And if the Bruins can stay healthy right now, and I mean, a lot of the veteran guys are playing unselfishly so that they don't get hurt on plays that they shouldn't get hurt on. Right. Like the other night, back is just passed the puck to Krejci when he could have easily shot it into the empty net. Um, but I think it's I think it's going to come down to whether the Bruins can stay healthy, and um, I think it's going to be Vegas and Boston right now in the finals. Ah, oh, what a prediction that is. That, would be that crazy. sounds fun. Yeah. That'll be really cool to be able to have something like that and with a brand I, new team. Yeah, I think the NHL will be very happy with that. And I wouldn't even be upset if the Bruins lost because it would be against the expansion team. Yeah, you know, you never know what to expect in any, in any kind of series like that. But I think that would be a lot of fun and good for the NHL definitely. Uh, this week for the Bruins, there were um, a couple games that definitely need to be discussed here a little bit, including Wednesday's game. Uh, Wednesday was against the arch enemy, of course, the Canadians, with Claude Julien returning home to the Garden. I think everybody knows my feelings on Claude Julien, but I want to talk about that and then ask the question about whether we feel the Bruins would be better off with Claude right now. First, Joe, did you get a chance to see the... Reception for Claude when he returned. Uh, I didn't watch the beginning of the game, so I didn't get to necessarily see the reception. Okay. I mean, you know, I'm sure it wasn't that great. You know, but he did bring a Stanley Cup here at one point, so, you know, you can't How, how much do you credit him for the Stanley Cup, Not though? A, I don't credit him, you know, too much. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't think there's a lot of love lost. Like, Correct. He's just, you know... We got rid of them. We did what we had to do, and now we're on to a better chapter in the Bruins. History. I call it the John Farrell. The John Farrell I, yes. I think they got lucky winning the Cup because there were a lot of games that mm-hmm. in that playoffs that they should not have won, and they ended up coming out victorious. Um, I mean, they pushed every team to seven games each time, each series. So that it, with Claude as a coach, they had a lot of fight in them. But again, after the 2013 season, I wanted him shipped out. Yep. Um, with Cassidy coming in almost a year ago now, um, it helps because he's been around all the Aren't young guys. I think like forty five and eighteen regular season with Cassidy since he's been coach. Yeah, so, some, yeah something, something like ridiculous that. It's like that. an insane, insane. That's record. incredible. I think that the that there does deserve to be a lot of credit for Cassidy, in, in my opinion, and I look at that because here's a guy that was a coach for Providence for what eight eight nine years, something like that. These guys had played for him, the younger guys, in the system already, yep. so they knew what they were going to be getting when Cassidy became the head coach. He's shown a lot of patience with the young guys, something that Claude never did. Claude was very quick on the trigger with putting the veterans out, in my eyes, way too much. Sitting, sitting some of the guys that were young, not, not as well. And I think Claude's the reason why guys like Tyler Sagan isn't here anymore. I think Claude's the reason Dougie Hamilton isn't here anymore. Um, and some of the other guys that we've had in the system that didn't want to play here. I think Claude was the reason. And some people don't talk about the, the reasoning behind why Sagan or Hamilton aren't here anymore. I think it deserves, it deserves to be talked about. Well, Sagan, some of the stuff he did isn't very child appropriate. Yes, uh. th- that point, <laughs> yes, I agree. But I think Claude's one of the reasons. I think he's won. Well, I mean, on another note, I was reading an article the other day in the uh, Boston Globe uh, that had Marshawn and Krug saying a lot of good stuff about Claude, how they, how he helped them better themselves. Do you believe it? I think so. I mean, look at Marshawn. Look at Marshawn. He was a little, he was a pesky brat when he first came to the NHL, mm-hmm. and he changed a lot over the years. And you mm-hmm. can't say it was Don Sweeney that helped him do that. What has he done, Don Sweeney? I mean, is he better than Shirelli? I think I think if, if Don Sweeney was the general manager back when we got Sagan, I think Sagan would still be playing on this team right uh, now. And that that that's what the killer is because this past week, like I said, we were going to be talking about the games this week. Sagan gets an overtime goal, sends the Bruins home on a loss. They still got their point and all, but that sort of stuff shouldn't happen. It shouldn't. Sagan should still be here. Well, the Bruins shouldn't have gone too do- down to nothing in the first no, place. No, they looked like they crap came back that and Tuesday pushed, game. They pushed it to get a, get a point and continue their streak. Um, but we all know I'm a huge Sagan fan, mm-hmm. so I, I can't really complain that he got the game winner. Right. Um, but, yeah, if, if 
uh, there is a lot of things that you could say, what if? Because, yeah. you know, Dougie could still be on the team. But then again, I wasn't really a fan of Dougie because he was playing with Char. And no, and I wasn't that big of a fan of him as well. I'm just saying that the pieces that you got in return for all this stuff really hasn't accounted for You have nothing to show for Sagan anymore. Nothing. Right. There's that's that's not embarrassing. Single, there's not a single person from that trade. The Dougie honored. Hamilton, yeah, wasn't that the, pick 14, 15, 15 team, 16? Huh? Do we have anybody on the team still from that trade? No. I no, thought so. Not a nothing. single person. No. Isn't that yeah, terrible? That's what I'm saying. But again, I agree with him. The, you can't you got sit here all day and play the what if game. No, you because, can't. Because, you know, you we're can't. in a good spot now and, you know, some things happen for a reason. That, but that's I'd love why to, to have me, him. Yeah. Th this is all very, it, it's very surprising to me to see. This is like the biggest surprise, I think, of all teams. I think we pretty much expected the Celtics to do, do what they were going to do in a way. I didn't expect the Bruins to be coming out here and being the talk I, of the town right I now. I didn't even expect no. that. No, you couldn't have, <laughs> didn't expect it. You told me that you know three months ago. I would have told you you're crazy. I was I about mean, ten games into the season. I was about to give up on them. I was, we we I have was a Patriots saying, playoff game coming up this Sunday, now. and it seems like there's more excitement for the Bruins right now. Yeah. City of Boston's rolling right now. Yeah, it's just it's, it's speechless. I mean, I don't I don't watch a lot of basketball, but ten games into the hockey season, I was about to say, all right, let's I'm switching sports. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's how I feel too. The other game um, after the Canadians was was the Islanders. Yep. Um, the Islanders are a team that honestly are a pretty. They have a good roster. I they think they have a good roster. They haven't been playing well. They this haven't been playing well. Um, There's another Bruin too the, for you. The Bruins have their number right now. Which one? Boychuk? Yes, yes. Somebody one. that I and really Seidenberg. liked. I, yeah, and Sidenberg. Yep. Two guys that are on that team. I don't that, think either of them even played last night. Nope. No. Nope. They did not play last night. Um, and, of course, they have guys like uh, John Tavares, who I, I really like. But yeah. Nick Letty is probably one of the best defensemen in the league. They didn't have much to show last night. So the Bruins get another, another win, which continues to huge uh, be huge for the Bruins. The other thing I wanted to do to close out the Bruins segment is we did hear a retirement note this week. Not a player, but somebody that who has sung the national anthem at games for years and years and years. <laughs> Renee Rancourt. This will be his last season. Why are we laughing about it? I mean, he's been singing the national anthem for the Bruins. Uh, for it is kind of years. funny. He is funny. I, I will say he is quite the he's entertainer. Funny. He's a good character. Yeah. But I feel like it's you know it's kind of it was long overdue. Yeah, long overdue. Long overdue. overdue. Yeah, you think so? But, describe it. Okay. but what's funny is that he's going to be they're going to honor him at the last game. That's a makeup of the game that got snowed out a couple weeks ago against Florida. Okay. Uh, April eighth. April eighth, Renee Rancourt Day. Get your tickets now. <laughs> Willie O'Ree Day yesterday is now, yes. from now on, known as Willie O'Ree Day in Boston. Yep, I will put that on my uh, calendar so I, I, I know that, so I can, we can celebrate on that, too. Yep, first African-American player to make it in the NHL. Yep, so that's, that's a very nice thing that could be recognized years right there. Yep, absolutely. Anything else, Bruins, before we close this out? I mean, I could go on all day. I know you could. <laughs> I know you could. But we also have a big game that we have to talk about, and that's the uh, New England Patriots. Groundhog Day again. Here we go. AFC yeah. Championship. This time it's not the Pittsburgh Steelers, which was very shocking to me. We have the Jacksonville Jaguars. What are our expectations on this one? Let's go to Joe first. Um... Well, to go off shocking, I think the most shocking part about last week wasn't necessarily that the Jags won, okay. but the fact that they scored 45 points. <laughs> yeah, and I would say that too. allowed 42 points. That was the most shocking thing about that game, because going into it, you probably thought that was a 2017 game or yeah, something along scoring. that nature. Yep. Um, as far as predictions for this week, you know, Tom's healthy. We don't even talk about anything else. So he's good. He's playing. As long as he plays, My hand hurts. I Sorry. think, you know, Spread-wise, we'll probably cover the spread at 7.5. We're probably going to blow them out, you know, I think. Got something with yeah. my hand today. I don't know. It's a little Don't a little get stiff. into it. It's a little not stiff good. today. It's fine. Well, oh, okay. I, I wasn't as surprised by the 45-point game because um, if you looked at the schedule earlier in the season, Jaguars blew out Pittsburgh like 35-7 to 7 or something like yeah. that, some crazy score like that. Um, my expectations for the game this weekend, I think – as long as Leonard Fournette is shut down, mm -hmm. it will be a blowout of a game because Blake Bortles cannot throw a football for his life. Except for last week. Except for last okay. week. Okay. 
Well, well, I mean, it uh, really wasn't I, much of him though last I week. Think, I credit system. I credit that game to Leonard Fournette. It's a yeah, it's a controlled yeah. system. He gets a, he gets a lot of free throws off pass um, play action. So here's my thing, and, and and here's why I give the Patriots the upper advantage in this week, and not because I'm a homer. It's because Belichick and the defensive unit traditionally have been able to stop the big runner. Have they not over the years? Yeah, I mean, typically they just take away your best player. They take it so, away. So if they go and take away Fournette, they're gonna have they're gonna try their best to see how Blake Bortles can beat them. I I just don't think that's possible. James Harrison is gonna shut down Fournette. That would be amazing. That, that would be pretty amazing. That would be great. That would be pretty amazing to and, see that. And Flowers has been having an, outst- an incredible end of the season so far. Yes, he has. And that's something that they're going to need the performance of from him for Sunday. Um, I think looking towards what we can see for Jacksonville, I again, I'm saying that Fournette gets shut down. I, I think that that's their big guy that they have to – concern themselves with. The backfield is going to be needing to be ready to get some interceptions because it's going to happen. Off the air, we talked about who does Blake Bortles have for weapons outside of Fournette. And you know what? There's really not that many. There's Marquise Lee, who is about as fragile as a glass uh, window. A glass window. We also, they, they don't have much. They just don't have much. They still have Allen Robinson. He's hurt. Yeah, I that's believe. what I thought. He's hurt. Um, you know, I, they do throw it to the fullback a lot just because off-play action stuff with the run. So, I mean, I guess you Didn't could Didn't the guy Davis catch his first two touchdowns of the year last week? Something like that? So, yeah. 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 So, something like that. There's just not that many weapons there. Now, if you look at the Patriots <coughs> side of things, I would say the Patriots are about as healthy as they've been right now since week one. I mean, I think we're the healthiest we can get. I, I totally you know, without agree. Without IR people, I think we literally are the healthiest week. What was get. fun to me on looking at the game that we had last week against the Titans <clears throat> was the Titans started off their game 7-0. Yeah. So the Patriots had to kind of get it going because it wasn't going so well at the very beginning of the game. Who was the X factor that started it to get it going? Who was that X factor? I'd probably give a lot of the credit to the pass rush. I mean, a playoff record of eight sacks last week. I look That's at something that, that gets you but I'm going. thinking of an, an, of, on an offensive side of the ball. Can you tell me James White? It Is wasn't James want? White. No. no. Was it a receiver? It was not a receiver. Deion Lewis. It was Deion Lewis who got it all going. Lewis, doing the runs that he did, was able to set up James White to get two yeah. touchdowns. So my credit goes to Lewis by pushing himself just a little bit more to get down the field and get ourselves you know, into... Um, you know, first down territory and all, and, and get get the ball to White pretty much back-to-back to get two touchdowns. But the, the real question is, do we credit Le'Veon Bell for Deion Lewis running the way he is right now? Because a lot of commentators have been saying he's been looking uh, looking a little similar to Le'Veon Bell. Great. If that's what it takes, that's excellent. Lewis helps Brady out tremendously because it enables Brady not to have so much pressure on himself right now to – throw the ball off to a receiver who is most likely going to be rusty. I mean, Chris Hogan scored a touchdown during last week, which was excellent. Yeah. That was his first touchdown since October. He's been banged up right. and hurt for forever. Gronk we know, we know Gronk is Gronk. Gronk's going to probably get a touchdown this upcoming week, just like he always does. James White was huge. James White was somebody that was not real healthy during all of the season. If White can be our spark that gets us to the Super Bowl, that's fantastic. They need that. But my big player that, outside of Deion Lewis and everything, is Danny Amendola. Playoff Danny Dola. Amendola was phenomenal on, on, on Saturday night. That was great. It was clutch. He, he looked like, he looked I'm not like, going to say Julian Edelman, because Edelman, Edelman is Edelman. It, he, he looked like a Wes Welker. Well, I mean, again, uh, you know, most people call him playoff Dola. This is really where he makes his money for the season is, you know, he's that extra guy that, you know, when we have a Julian Edelman and, and a Chris Hogan and a Malcolm Mitchell, yep. you know, he's covered up by all those pieces being better. Right. And then in the playoffs, he can kind of sneak into these extra holes. And, and, you know, he's a good security blanket. He made a couple of great catches um, on that cross field throw from Tom Brady on that third down. I love that, that, was that unbelievable. little, that little, the little yep. dunk off there. Yeah. That was that, that was funny. To I mean, see that. playoff Dola is huge for the Patriots, and they need it. Yes. They definitely need yeah. it. They need that production so they can um, 
get their next ring, which would be six, I believe. Yep, absolutely. We've got, we're chasing that's, six right now. That's why that's why the Patriots are so dangerous against other teams because they never know where Brady's going to go if they can't get to Brady in time. I want to go back to um, talking about the Jaguars and the Steelers for a second because the Steelers need to be criticized for why they're not at Gillette right here. And I want to break it down so people can understand what we see as fans and what we see from observing the game. <clears throat> I want to share my opinion from it. I think it's deplorable on Pittsburgh not being um, facing New England this upcoming week. In a way, I feel Pittsburgh was too distracted and too focused on trying to get to play the Patriots that they forgot about Jacksonville. Do you think that's a correct statement? Or do you think it's, it's different? I'll start with Tom. Do you think that the Pittsburgh Steelers focused way too much attention and time trying to think that they could beat the Patriots versus focusing any attention on the Jaguars? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Because I saw a picture on uh, Facebook like a couple days after, and I forget who, which player it was, but he said that they could beat the Patriots anywhere. Like He, he um, named a Mike few Mitchell. places. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, Mike Mitchell. He it named was. a few places, and he said, but we can beat them anywhere. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of the players' focus was a lot of the players' focus was on beating, getting to the Patriots, getting to Gillette, and just dominating them and getting to the Super Bowl. And they forgot that they were facing the team that early in the season beat them by twenty plus points. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I agree. Um, I think you know they had a lot of distractions. I know outside of Mike Mitchell's comments, um, I know he was outside of the locker room before the game, yelling into the Jaguars locker room. Mm -hmm. um, I know Le'Veon tweeted earlier that day that he loves round twos, and yep. he was going to get two weeks in a row of round two, so he was already looking ahead. Yep. Um, I also think the biggest thing that I took away was the onside kick at the that end of the game from so Mike Tomlin with two timeouts left. And I understand his logic of, you know, they didn't really stop him that much, but, you know, you're taking a 15% chance of getting an onside kick versus giving your team, you know, with two minutes and 18 seconds left, technically three timeouts. Mm. And a chance to get the ball back, and they weren't stopping that offense. No, Pittsburgh was rolling at that point. I don't. I thought he should have taken the shot with his defense. I thought that was one of the dumbest decisions I've ever yeah. seen. It, it's right up there with that, with the, with the toss from Russell Wilson when Malcolm yeah. Butler, well, picked it off. Did Mike Tomlin lose focus too? Because I mean, if I think you... Mike Tomlin is one of the most overrated coaches in the NFL. I'm so tired of seeing. People give him credit. He's ter he has no clue how to coach a game. No clue. Or Sorry, my rant's over. Yeah, or a team, or a team for that though. matter. Because if your players are going and saying stuff like, oh, we're going to beat the Patriots, we're already, we're already beating the Jaguars. Um, like if you can't control your players, saying, telling them, like, hey, we need to focus on this game, then you already lost your team. And if you're going to make a call, a call at the end of the game to kick an onside kick, then that's basically on your team because you just lost your team and you basically gave up. I, I couldn't agree more. They also, last year, they had the Antonio Brown yeah. Facebook Live scandal in the locker room. Um, but I agree. If you have Ben Roethlisberger, Le'Veon Bell, and Antonio Brown on offense, yep. your life as a coach on offense is extremely easy. <laughs> and then to have the pieces he has on defense, to not be able to put together one final season to just, you know, and do I think that they're fully capable of beating us? Absolutely. I think the Steelers yeah, could beat us do. whenever they wanted to if they actually had they good structure They should have beat and us during the regular season. Yes, they should have. But that's what I'm saying. So, you know, to know that they already could have beaten us once and they had another shot, yep. they should have just focused on getting the job done in Jacksonville or with Jacksonville. And then come to New England. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think that's a lot on Mike Tomlin as much as it is his players. And a, I agree with that. Few, a few people. And, and they put the blame on the offensive coordinator because he gets fired. Yeah. Th yeah. That's where the blame goes. Because that's how much respect they have. What for a Tomlin, dysfunctional team. So dysfunctional. I was more worried about facing Pittsburgh this weekend than I am Jacksonville. Uh, that's all same. I, I was totally. P because Pitt me. Pittsburgh would have had the upper edge in my, in my but, eyes because they already had a bug up there. From knowing that the Patriots came back and beat them during the regular season, James it never should have happened. Coming over to us too. Yep. And I mean, Antonio Brown playing on, you know, seventy-five percent of a calf was doing things that most receivers He's the at hundred percent don't do. He honestly, so he, he really was is. dangerous at seventy-five percent. Give him an extra week to recover. Yeah. Come to New England, you know. 
I'm sure he. I mean, look what they were back. able to do. What did Jacksonville have a 21-7 lead at one yeah. point? Yeah. yeah. And Roethlisberger was just throwing seed after seed right to him, and got that game right back into something competitive very quickly. Yeah. You know, yeah. all in all, Pittsburgh should have won that game too. Right. So Pitts, Pittsburgh choked away pretty much their season. Uh, aside, if I were an owner, I would toss out that coach Tomlin in a in a heartbeat. Aside from aside from the uh, defensive recovery fumble touchdown by Jacksonville, it was it was the worst defensive game I've probably seen. Oh, there was no defense at all. You know, and that's the number one defense supposedly in the NFL, the Jaguars. They should be ashamed of themselves for that. Yeah. So that's why, to me, I'm looking at this game that. The, People keep saying it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, it might be a little bit of a challenge, but I, I totally see the Patriots winning this game. Going right back to the Super Bowl against who is going to be the question. So this is a good time right now for our, our Sports Zone 101 Facebook Twitter poll of the week. Who would you like in the Super Bowl, or who do you think is going to be in the Super Bowl? Do you think it's going to be the Patriots and the Vikings? Do you think it's going to be the Patriots and the Eagles? Do you think it's going to be Jacksonville and the Eagles, or do you think it's going to be Jacksonville and the Jaguars? No, Jacksonville and, Vikings. and the Vikings, excuse me. <laughs> Screwed that up. <laughs> Take a look at our uh, online, do a little vote, see what you think is going to happen, and we'll share our opinions with everybody next week before we get ready for the Super Bowl. Let's Hopefully talk, it's going to be a good thing. Let's talk real quick about that ending to that Saints-Minnesota game. Though. Please. That let's was, talk about that, too, because that I mean, was... <laughs> that would have been pretty cool if it was. I, I, I was more. I was more looking. I, I wanted the Saints and the Patriots. That's that's really I, what yeah, I wanted. I wanted, Breeze, I wanted to see Breeze and Brady. Yeah. Yep. That okay. was your um, best quarterback match that you could have seen. But I mean, we we had our staff meeting that night, and we all thought leave going to the meeting. We all thought Saints had this in the bag. Yep. They were going to win, and then we got to the meeting. They Minnesota kicked the field goal, went up. Saints kicked the field goal, and then all of a sudden, halfway through the meeting, like oh. Holy cow, Minnesota won that game. How? Yeah. Yeah. 61 yards. Do you get a chance catch. to go back and watch it a little bit to see what happened? Yeah, I mean, as okay. I pulled in for the meeting, yeah. it had happened. And I was like, oh, I'll just get out. And I went to you know, take the keys out of the ignition. And then the announcers are going crazy. And I was like, you can't tell me that. You know, Two seconds ago, they had no shot. And now the guy's running into the end zone scoring. I was like, this is unbelievable. But I right. went back and watched it. And there's no coverage. You know, there's just a tough break. I mean, you know, they're telling him probably not to get a pass interference okay. and to keep him in bounds. So he's trying to take a, you know, heavy angle to his outside. How do you how do you in. coach that if you're a coach? It didn't seem like they were doing much coaching. Well, I mean, you know, it's tough because you know, if you tell the kid to not take a pass interference, you know, that automatically makes him play a lot softer because he's not going to try and take that guy down in that situation. I can see that. You know, if you tell him, you know, cuz one of the rules I think, too, this would get me on a whole other rant that I don't want to get on, is I don't like the pass interference like call rants. in the NFL. Okay. I think the pass interference call should be the same as it is in college football. It's a, it's a go back 15 yard penalty from where the ball was when it was thrown. That makes sense. Not, you know, don't throw a 50 yard pass, get a pass interference. Why do you think the NFL keeps downfield. it the way it is? It doesn't go the college route. I don't know, to be honest with you. I think that, you know, that's a huge game changer. You know, because I would, if I tell. That changes my logic as a coach. I tell that safety to take the pass interference if Correct. he's going to catch it. Correct. Because now they're just going to go 15 yards, yep. you know, and now they got to snap it and go. Do you sometimes blame the officials on not knowing the call, too? Because it seems like the officials, some, some are 50-50 on what to call in a situation like that. Yeah, I guess sometimes they got to just be better with situational, like, is this a spot in the game where we're going to let these guys play it out? Mm -hmm. Or is this a spot in the game where I can throw this flag and it's not going to be a big deal? Right. Like, they need to kind of get that going. But, again, it's a judgment call. You know, not everybody's going to get it right every time. It's tough to call it in real time, too, because yeah. there are little things that happen that they show in the replay, and you're like, oh, that should have been a flag. Like, why, yeah. why was it the flag thrown? But if you think about it in real time, it's not something that they're going to pick up on. It's like, it's yeah. like in baseball. Or like two years in baseball when they used to throw the ball the first and it was a bang bang play and now they can review it. Mm -hmm. But before it was like, oh, was he out? Was he safe? Like we don't know until we see. the I replay. don't like the instant replay in baseball. I don't, especially when it's close calls like that. I think it ruins the game. I don't like the instant replay in football anymore either. I don't I like it. I think there's too much replay. It's too much everywhere. It slows, it slows games down. Honestly, we can, we should have robots out in the field now instead of real people because the robots honestly would make the right call. 
Why, why, why pay an official anymore? Right. You just go right back to the camera and, and it's all set. Yeah. You really don't need an official. Anymore. It's sad. Speaking of the officials, we did not talk about this part in the Patriots game upcoming. Did any of you see who one of the lead officials is for Jacksonville Patriots this week? Clint Blakeman? Hear of him? Uh, I he's, mean, familiar. I feel like if I saw his face, he's I the know one. He's... He, he's an official that the Patriots have a losing record against. He's the one that. Uh, remember when we played the Ravens and Brady kind of got upset about there was a pass interference call and they walked off the field and stormed it. Belichick was trying to push the guy and grab him about yeah. why we. That's the guy. So we haven't had a very good record against this official that's calling this game on Sunday. Is there any concern about that? No. Okay. I mean, again, if the refs somehow control this game, then the Pats aren't doing what they should do. Okay. Is the way I look at it. Because I know some people will look, are probably, oh, boy, we got this. Here comes the uh, doubters and everything about this official coming in. Shouldn't be concerned about it? Okay. No. That was my last part I wanted to say on the Patriots side. Anything else that we saw from that um, Vikings-Saints game? Oh, I have a good question for you both. Is... Case Keenum legit? Is he somebody that strikes the fear of God into you that can make the Vikings win? Um, well, <clears throat> I kind of forgot that he's been in the league for <laughs> multiple years. Um, well, he was used to be with Houston, right? Houston, Houston LA, St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, I think he was in Vi- he was Minnesota for a while too before he went to Houston. Yeah, and now he's getting the and opportunity. Yeah. I mean, and Nick Foles is another one that's been in the league We have for a three while quarterbacks, too. folks, that are in AFC Championship games. Blake Bortles, Case Keenum, Nick Foles. and Nick Foles. And then you have Tom Brady. That's just stunning to me. Well, the no best- Aaron Rodgers, no Drew Brees. It's not good for the NFL. No Matt Ryan. No Matt Ryan. No Ben No Andrew Locke. Nothing. The, the best thing I Cam saw... Cam Newton, you can even throw him in. The best thing I saw was Tom Brady's win percentage in AFC games and Blake Bortles' complete, uh, completion rating percentage yeah, this year. Too. And it was like it, Brady's 75% to Bortles' is like 56%. And it, they were, so, it was like, oh, Brady has a better chance of winning the AFC championship game than Blake Bortles and making a pass. <laughs> Uh, it's stunning. It's, just it's, it's stunning to see this. I mean, any 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 odds maker out there would give the Patriots the upper hand in any of those games. I would think. Uh, I yeah. would think. Um, let's go Super Bowl predictions real quick, and then I want to jump into um, a couple things with the Patriots uh, story that came out a couple okay. weeks ago. Um, what do you think? What do you think it's going to be? Super Bowl. I think. Is it all right to talk about that before yeah. the game? I, I yeah, think it it's is. Just a yeah. prediction. Just of, our predictions. Basically, on what you're just saying who's going to win the AFC Championship. Exactly. That's what we're thinking. I think it's going to be the Patriots and the Eagles. I would like that a lot. And, you know, I don't say it because it's the matchup I would prefer. I say it because I think the Eagles are good enough on defense and Nick Foles is just average enough to get it done okay. with the weapons they have. Yep. To win, and I think it's going to be a tight one. You know, it could go either way in the NFC, but I think the Eagles will come out on top because of defense, which is a tough call because the Vikings have a great defense too. Yeah. So, I mean, I I want it to be Patriots Vikings. Um, I, I mean, the NFC game is a tougher tougher call to make. Uh, I think it'll all depend on how Murray does in the running game for the Vikings. Um, or how Cox does for the Eagles on defense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I want I want Patriots Vikings. I can't really make a call because it's just the NFC game is just too tough, too tough to even make a call for. I'm gonna go with Patriots Eagles as well. I'm giving it to the Eagles. I don't want Minnesota. If Minnesota ends up getting to the Super Bowl, it's gonna be like a home game for them because that's where the Super Bowl is going to be. Uh, yes, they, Joe told me that they would have to go to the visitors' locker room and stuff, and it would be 50-50 on what's split for you know game noise and game audio and stuff like that. But I just I, I don't want I, I think Minnesota has a better team than the Eagles. I do. I think Minnesota does. So I'm not going to be surprised if it's Minnesota. 
I, I just think it's outrageous if the Patriots don't make the Super Bowl. It would be one of the most disappointing things if they don't because they are far superior than Jacksonville. Far superior. I mean, let's be honest here. It should have been Steelers-Patriots, and if the Steelers won, heck, fine. But if the Patriots lose to Jacksonville here, embarrassing. that's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. How, you, you can hold your head on that one. That, that, would, that would not go over very well around here. Especially if we lose both our coordinators at the end of the season. Yeah, and that's Which the other thing that we're going to jump into. Let's talk a little bit about the noise. The noise meaning that there's been a lot of distractions around Patriot land in the past couple weeks because of a, a very explosive story that came out from Seth Witherstein from ESPN. Is it Wickersham? Or Wickersham, Wickersham whatever. Wickersham. It's all the Whatever. First name Seth, that's all. Yeah. He'll be fired in a week from them, anyways. <laughs> um, he had a story that came out about there being a lot of dysfunction with the Patriots with um, a power struggle. We have um, a conflict with Belichick. We have a conflict with Kraft. We have a conflict with Brady. We have a conflict with Garoppolo. Um, and some, some, different, some different sound pieces in there that definitely deserve some, some talking about. I first want to say from the story that I think some things in there are true, and I think some things in that story are outrageous. Um, did you both get a chance to read the article yes. and read the story? Okay, I, let's I start. Didn't. You did didn't. not. No. Okay, that's well, fine. Well, what's your... I want to know what you thought was outrageous first. I think one of the most outrageous accurate. things that was in there was the whole piece about Garoppolo being locked out of TB12. Okay. I think that was, that was a, a lie that came there. That was something that uh, never happened. It did. He think had his own pass. He had his facilities. own pass and everything to get in there, and Guerrero or Brady never denied anybody the treatment to go into there. The one, um, I, another piece that I think was ridiculous is the whole fact that Belichick is done after this season. He's under contract for two more years. So here's how I look at it. If he doesn't want to come back after this season – that's fine. I mean, but he's under contract for two years. Bob Kraft is not going to let him go to the Giants. If he does let him go to the Giants, then we get first-round draft picks. It's as simple as that. He won't leave. I just don't. There's no way. He already said he wasn't leaving. No. Again, he could have just said that to media, obviously, but I don't think he would leave. The end of the dynasty part of the Patriots, that part you can kind of see, but you have to put a team out on the field to have any sort of way of knowing that anything's over. Yes, yeah. Patricia and McDaniels are probably out of here. Yes. Yeah. McDaniels is most likely going to Indy, and uh, Patricia is most likely going to the Lions. But you have to use that next man up mentality. Yeah. The other part that I definitely agree here on is I do think that uh, Bob Kraft stuck his nose into the whole Garoppolo situation. I don't know what you feel on it, but I feel like Belichick wanted Garoppolo to be here. And I think Belichick, in a way, wanted Brady to be traded. I do think that that's, a, that's very possible in what happened. And I do think those three have butted heads because Tom Brady is Bob Kraft's boy. Kraft made the decision. He said, I'm sticking with you, Tom. You've done everything right as a Patriot. I'm going with you versus the kid. That may not be the best decision, business-wise, because I think Garoppolo was the next person that was going to take over for Brady. I can officially say that now, because some people didn't think I would say it. But yeah, I, I do think the bridge to gap things with Brady retiring and being the next person to kind of hold the torch, it was Garoppolo. So let's hear your side. All right, so... Um... You know, regardless of, you know, what's true and what's false, when you put three people of that stature in a room with the egos they all have, because one's the best owner in the league, one's the best coach of all time, and one obviously, depending on who you talk to, is the greatest quarterback of all time. Those three yeah. egos in a room, you're going to butt heads. You're going to have it's issues. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Which doesn't bother me at all. It's going to yeah. happen. You know, they're all people with big egos. Um as far as the Garoppolo thing, um, Bill Belichick has always said that he would always try and leave this organization in the best place possible mm -hmm. when he left. And I think part of him knew Jimmy G was his solution to that problem. 100%. When Tom left. And I know that he did not want to trade him. No. There's no way. No. 
You know, and then there's not you know, for what you got. Probably no. sat in there, you know, and you know said Tom's staying, and that's that's final. Which again, that can be a huge power struggle there because you can't make Bill Belichick the GM and coach, and then override him when he's trying to make a decision that's best for the franchise. I don't think he was it's trading Tom Brady. It. I don't think he would trade Tom Brady. I think his point was is that, you know, you got rid of Jacoby Brissett at the beginning of the year. That was kind of your statement of these are our two guys. This is who we're staying with. Right. For him to now have to get rid of Jimmy, the team is now put in three years sense. backtrack to get a new quarterback. You would have kept. You would have kept Jacoby Brissett if you weren't going to trade Garoppolo. And the biggest thing I took away from that article is the person who looked the worst was Tom Brady. That article made him look terrible. Yep. He made him look like a whiner. He yep. made him look like a control freak. Yep. They made him look bad with the uh, with the situation where he really didn't even mentor Garoppolo. Yep. It took him a long time to become friends with him. Yep. Like they made him look off when I think, you know, if anybody really took a loss, it was Tom Brady and Bill Belichick looked a lot more logical and thought out in his that's, process. That's why to me with this whole story coming out, was it a way for Belichick to get revenge on the Patriots? Did he go to somebody, no. whether it be Michael Rappaport or something, somebody that he's familiar with, would he have gone to somebody and said, this is really what's going on? Was this his way of getting back with Tom? No. No, see, and I think, you know, they've both said it. You know, they're really good friends. You know, how good of friends they are, you know, they might not go to dinner and eat dinner with each other all the time. But, no. You know, there's a mutual friendship there where I don't think any of it's them It's a ever coaching relationship. It's been that way since 2000. I think they're friends the off coach, the field. He's the coach. He's the player. I think they're friends off the field. I think they're just... Um, Not as close as most people Yeah, think. and I think they're responsible enough to, you know, hey, when we're here in the facility... I'm your coach, you're my player. This right. is how it works. When we're outside of closed doors, yes. we can be friends, which I think that's it. When they separate, it's fine, but I do think they're friends off the field. I don't think they would double-cross like that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I mean, I, I was surprised that Garoppolo got traded. I think we all were. When that came out, I was like, what? Yeah. What is yeah. this? It, and for what we got, that, that's why, that's why there, there are some parts of this story I'm going to believe. There's no way that Kraft, I mean, there's no way that, that Belichick trades Garoppolo for a second round pick if something's not up. Right. Hindsight's twenty twenty two. Like, you know, the way he's played now, too, it makes it look worse, mm -hmm. which is the worst part right. about that trade. Because, I mean, most people were thinking once Garoppolo, I mean, me included, once Garoppolo got traded, he was going to play the end of the season for San Fran, sign with us again at the end of the year. And then San Fran would get somebody, whether it was Hoyer or whoever. Um, but like, I, because I mean, I, I've seen a bunch of stuff with how Brady's talked about Garoppolo. I don't know if it's true or not, but it seemed like they were kind of friends. Mm -hmm. um, he said he, Brady felt that Garoppolo was a good quarterback. Um, but I mean, I was shocked. Unless. Belichick has something up his sleeve that no one else knows about. Or... And that could be possible because he doesn't say really anything to right. anybody. And we all know Belichick he always has something up his sleeve because they have a bunch of secret plays that no one ever knows when it's going to come out um, So in games. So, I mean, to it's... Tom's point, and it's an interesting point, why has San Francisco not signed Garoppolo long term right now? Um, I think they probably will. But why, think, why not now? Um, what are they going to say? I think part of the problem is Jimmy wants to see where he can go. Jimmy wants to win now. You know, he really didn't want to go to Cleveland. Right. That was something we all knew. Um, <clears throat> the San Francisco situation is better, but I don't think that's where he wants to be either. And I think he's kind of, you know, sticking his neck out there saying, hey, I've proven that with no weapons I can be – a pretty dominant player in this game. And I think he wants to see what offers he can get. I think San Fran wants Let's him make long it term. Easy. Let's make it easy for you. Could Garoppolo be back here next year? No. Is he interested enough to come back here? Let's say Brady wins the Super Bowl. That'll, that'll, that'll give him six rings, correct? Yes. Is he done? No. You don't know. You don't know, but... I don't know. I mean, he, he. We were on this show this time last year, and I continued to say he's going to play till he's 45. I look at it right now and say to myself, you know what? With so many distractions and so much change, he's going to lose his offensive coordinator as well. 
is is he going for is sayonara. he going for the record? Is he gonna? Is he I going? think Brady doesn't care about the record. I think Brady cares more about playing the game he loves. I look at it from seeing the article from everything and seeing how much he's invested in his business, TV12. It seems like he cared more. He cares more right now about TV12 than as the quarterback right now. Which for the to Patriots. me is life after football. Correct. So I. I mean, again, I, think I don't, think, it's super, I don't, think, it's super, I don't think a Super Bowl guarantees he retires. Do I think it's 45? No. I think his biggest accomplishment or something that he really wants to prove to people is that he can play as good as he did five years ago in his 40s. I think that's his big but you know, thing. if he retires after if, – if they win the sixth Super Bowl and he retires, does it make him look like, hey, I was going for the record and that's it? Could. Because if they – could. Because that's that's what my thought process is on it. But to that point, is Jimmy G waiting to see if Brady wins the Super Bowl and retires? That that's that's what I'm thinking right now. I mean, another thing too is they share the same agent. Tom Brady and Jimmy Garoppolo yep. have the same Don agent. Don Yee so, is the agent that represents yeah, so, both. You know, of them. Unless so. someone unless someone knows something that we don't, that could be the case too. This is why I like this show so much because these points here that we're talking about. I don't think they've been talked about much on any sports radio or, or talk show well, that's been out here. Most most sports radio. Everybody talk cares show about hates, all the hands. The Patriots, the Patriots oh, haters. oh, all this. No, we're talking about the things that, in my eyes, are things that we should be questioning and we should be thinking about and having a discussion about, because those are those are the outcomes that could happen. Too many people in the media are all about the right now factor. Let's think more about what could, let's read into more of the things that are happening from what we see and read from an article and a story to figure it out. My only other piece that that I want to say from this story here is, is there any good that happened from this story for the Patriots? Sure, I mean, again. Let's look at the Tom Brady side. Anything, well, I don't even, you don't even make it just about Tom Brady. Anything that is anti-Patriots always gets flipped in their locker room Correct. as us against the world. And I think, you know, with this article, and I know a couple of Jacksonville guys, is, you know, they've started running their mouths a bit. And anything yep. that people give us, and us, I mean the Patriots, turn into material. That's what I think. It's us against the world. I think it's always beneficial for us. Obviously, yep. you know, it's got its cons because it makes some people look bad. But at yep. the end of the day, you know, separate – this with what we have at task, they're going to make it an everybody against us. Right. And it's just more fuel to the fire for us. I think it motivated Brady a Absolutely. lot. Brady played awesome against the Titans, and he hadn't been playing so great. And right. yes, it's the Titans. Two weeks rest, too. Yes, two weeks rest helps as well. I, 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 I think we sort of rejuvenated Brady in a way. I think Brady, Brady was able to regain a little bit of a focus. He's got a, more of a pissed off kind of an attitude mm. right now that says, kind of, screw you. I'm going to go out and win and do what it takes. Well, that's I think what I, I think what, what helped that it. too is that the three of them, Belichick, Kraft, and Brady, all decided that in the off season after the season's over, they're gonna go into Kraft's office or his house, wherever they're gonna meet, and talk about the tension that was going on mm-hmm. between the three of them. There, you agreed, there is tension. Yeah. There has to be. Oh, there's always yes. gonna be yeah. tension. Yes, I, mean, especially, I agree. Especially when they've been together for so long. Yeah, 18 years ups and downs. We've talked a lot about the story here and everything. We didn't get to the whole Guerrero part of it, but I think more, most importantly here, we're talking about kind of where we're at. The Patriots are in the AFC Championship. That's what matters most. That's what the attention should be focused on and hopefully getting ring number six in the Super Bowl. So that, that's kind of uh, our expectation on what we want to put the focus on from everything. But that segment we just did there... Uh, definitely need to be discussed because mm-hmm. there are a lot of pieces and a lot of things that um, most people probably don't know about. Exactly. And I think that that's something that was important. We don't have enough time to do the Celtics. The Celtics are, are, are doing still great. They unfortunately had a loss last night without Kyrie. Mm-hmm. Without Kyrie. Right. The Celtics aren't as good. That's just how it is. Um, before we wrap it up, again, we just want to remind our, our audience, our Sports Zone 101 Facebook Twitter poll of the week. Which matchup will you see for the Super Bowl? Will you see the Patriots and the Vikings? Will you see the Patriots and the Eagles? Will you see Jacksonville 
uh, versus the Eagles, or you see Jacksonville and the Vikings. I got it right <laughs> this time. Yes. Take a look. Take a uh, to do your vote, and we will share our results the next show that we do. Anything else you want to do before we wrap it up here today? Good. Go Pats. Go Pats. Go Pats. And this Bruins. Nick Face signing off for another episode here of Face the Facts. Try your best to face the facts this week as well. We will see you next time. Goodbye.